power partitions, and in a sense, the most fun, because it's really about the circle method. And to my great surprise, when I did these calculations, this is uh, only four or five months ago, it's quite recent, uh, many, many things were different from the classical case. I assumed once you had the basic asymptotics, everything would be essentially the same. But it's not at all, as you'll see today. So that's quite fun. And then the last topic of next time will be about this very slowly convergent sum that I mentioned already in the uh, poster that announced the course. And then I couldn't find my notes and didn't know where they were. And I still never found them. But at least I found lots of notes on the computer, including some things I'd even written in tech. So I will be able to tell that story. So next time will be completely independent of this time. And there won't be any further time, so then you're off the hook. So for today, I want to tell the, the rest of the story of these uh, power partitions. So remember, the problem was, so I'm talking about power partitions, so S power, uh, especially S equals 2, I'll talk about most of the time because it's the most interesting, and then I can, be, you know, can give actual numerical things. Uh, so remember that P s of n, for instance, P 2 of n, is the number of representations of decompositions, let's say, unordered uh, as, a, as an unordered sum of s powers e.g. of squares, and the generating function of that, so the sum p s of n q to the n, where p s of 0 is by definition 1, uh, has, again, more or less by definition, or this is what Euler found in the case s equals 1, it has the expansion 1 minus q to the m to the s. And so therefore, by, the, by Cauchy's formula, we know that little p s of n is 1 over 2 pi i times the integral over any path encircling 0 inside the unit disk. So for instance, the circle of radius r less than 1. And then p2 of q, dq, divided by q to the n plus 1. So the circle method consists in looking at the singularities of p2 of q. And that's what we did last time, well, the first time numerically and last time proving things. And we found that P2 of Q has a very well-defined, it, blow, it blows up or sometimes goes to zero. It can be both. Unlike the case S equals 1, it's sometimes very big. Sometimes very small in the neighborhood of each root of unity. But it has a well-defined asymptotic, and more than asymptotic, even an exact formula at every root of unity. And so therefore, this will be equal to the sum, well, it'll be dominated by the sum over kappa in Q mod Z of a contribution, let's say, P S comma kappa of N. So this is the contribution, but this isn't very precise, and I'll, I'll say more about that. Contribution from the part of the integral here, and then it's a root of unity, but that root of unity will always write as e, your members, e to the 2 pi i of some rational number kappa. So the biggest contribution will always be if kappa is 0 and zeta is 1, but there'll also be contributions when kappa is a half, zeta is minus 1, kappa is a quarter, zeta is i, and so on. So the, the, that's the basic circle method, and it's been known ever since the famous paper of Hardy Ramanujan, 1918, and many other later famous papers, Hardy Littlewood, uh, Radermacher, Vinogradov, and many other people used it for a variety of, of problems. So I'm going to concentrate, as I said, on s equals 2. I'll say if you one part, I'll give the forms for all s, but in general for s equals 2. So I want to emphasize uh, the differences and in fact, so I'll have five numbered points. And in fact, that will be the whole lecture uh, to the case A, S equals 1. So the first one is P S of n grows much more slowly 
which is good and bad, it means in particular that if you want to have big numbers and see the estimates, you have to take a much bigger n, which uh, I'll come to in a second. So roughly, we know uh, from Hardy, and, well, it's actually quite elementary, and certainly Ramanujan knew that already in England, that for usual partitions, P1 of n, the log, I won't put the exact constant, although of course it's known, it goes like the square root of n, but if you take P2 of n, I gave the formula in the first lecture, it's of the order of the cube root of n, and in general, for any s, it's of the order of the s plus first root of n. So therefore, you know, it's, it still goes to infinity, but it's exponential only in a fractional power of, of n. So that certainly has some effect. Then, instead of Mr. McMahon, but he's not just Mr., of course, Major McMahon, who is the famous calculator that uh, uh, Hardy knew and that Hardy and Ramanujan talked a lot with, and in the, in the movie by Ken Ono and others, which you should definitely see if you ever get the chance. He plays a not very flattering role, but anyway, he's certainly he occurs in the movie. He was quite uh, very, very old-fashioned prejudiced, certainly not happy about an Indian getting involved in any of these things. But then instead of, instead of Major McMahon, who was a brilliant calculator, but of course by hand, we have electronic computers. So therefore, even though we have to take a much bigger n to get interesting numbers because of this slower growth, it's not a problem at all. So Hardy and Ramanujan uh, studied in particular, I mean, the famous number that they analyzed, and I'll give the details in a second, studied the number which they considered huge because using a, a very clever form of, of Hardy, of, of Euler, Major McCain was able to complete, compute the number of partitions, so P is just P1, uh, of the number 200. And they were very you know, impressed that one could go that far. And so that number is 3972. Nine, nine, nine for the Ramanujan day. I learned this number by heart, but I've already forgotten. So it was this 13-digit number, uh, which obviously, if you try to count all those partitions by just writing out 1 plus 1 plus 1, 200 times, and 1 plus 1, 198 times plus 2, you wouldn't ever get there. But there's a very nice recursion due to Euler that is only the square root of n terms. So you can compute p of 200 with just of the order of 20 additions and subtractions, but only if you have all the previous piece. You have to make a table up to 200, and of course you have to make no mistakes, otherwise you, it won't work. So this was quite a, a tricky computation, but indeed Major McMahon did it thrice. But we can do, and this took pro probably many, certainly many hours for Major McMahon to do this by hand, no matter how start you have. We can compute P2 of n not just for one value, well, they all said to go up to 200, I said it's recursive, but not, up, not just up to uh, 200, but up to 10 to the five in two seconds, in less than two seconds. I'll actually write down the Paris program in a second so that those of you who aren't used to Paris can see once again that it's pretty easy to, uh, to do. Well, I can do it immediately. So you start with the power series one, but you have to decide on the precision because it's like a real number on a computer. You have to say how many digits you're giving. So I start with 1 plus O of x to the 100,001. So if I do things to that, the first the coefficient up to x to the 100,000 will be correct. And then having defined that, you put a semicolon. And now you take exactly this expansion here. I'm going to take y originally to be the denominator because it's faster to multiply than divide. Well, actually, I could divide and then the pro, no, I'll, I'll, I'll multiply because it's slightly faster. So I multiply uh, y star equals in many lambs like c uh, means that you multiply y by what's on the right hand. So you replace y by the old previous value of y, which is originally 1, times the right hand side. And here you have x to the power, x would be q. So you see this is exactly this product 1 minus q to the m to the s, where s is now 2. And that's the whole program. And then at the very end, since I want the reciprocal, you uh, replace y by 1 over y. I don't really need the last semicolon. And then that new y will be the power series p2 of q. And you can read off all the coefficients. So this takes, as I said, two seconds. 
So what you find is the, so the, the coefficient so in, in Paris language, that would be the 100,000th coefficient of this is called Paul coefficient. It's, it's not a polynomial, it's a power series, but it's the same uh, command. So the 100,000th coefficient, I won't write out the whole number because it is 60 digits. I'll give you the first four, uh, the first six and the last six. But as I say, not just to get this one number, to get all 100,000 numbers takes two seconds. So here there are 48 digits, and I've omitted. So we have plenty of numerical evidence, and if we have a, a theory, just as they use this number very much to test whether their asymptotic formula was working, and we can do the same you know, with, with much bigger numbers. So that certainly changes the nature of the game. And it's important when you're thinking about asymptotics that the theory of asymptotics now is different from, let's say, when Hardy wrote his book or when Euler, yet much earlier, worked out the Euler-McLaurin summation form. They were thinking of asymptotics as something that if you worked very hard, you could get 20 digits by working for a whole day. But we think in terms of you want to be able to get hundreds of digits, maybe, or 50, 100, several hundred in maybe split seconds. So the fact that there are computers uh, has certainly changed the way we think about large numbers and about asymptotics. It's not just uh, theory anymore. It really is very practical. OK, now I'll come to the theoretical part. And first, the sort of least interesting would be point three. Four will be more interesting and different from the case for s equals one. And five will be the most different and the last. But already three, there are several differences. So let me explain a little how this works. So as I already said, each uh, kappa in Q mod Z, or equivalently Z, which is e to the 2 pi i kappa in the you know, root of unity, which is usually written mu infinity, the union of all mu n, uh, each kappa gives a contribution that I'll call generically uh, P s comma kappa, as I already did. And I already wrote what this is. So P s kappa of n is the uh, contribution to the part of the integral near n. So let me write again what I wrote for ps of n. But now let me write uh, it. So instead of taking the original integral over a circle, q of a certain radius, I'll take it in the upper half plane. So tau is often more useful. Remember, q is e of, e to, the, e of tau, e to the 2 pi tau. I'll go from some tau 0, which will typically be very low, you get the asymptotics, but in principle, it's true for any tau zero. If you simply integrate from tau zero to tau zero plus one, then you'll take this function p2 of q, which is now p2 of e of tau, times e of minus n tau d tau. So this is an exact equation for any tau zero in the upper half plane. But then, uh, so then p2 of kappa, p s comma kappa, is the integral near kappa. So here is kappa. And kappa is a rational number. So let's say it's 3 fifths. We imagine a small interval around it. And then you take some kind of a peak up to a certain height. And we'll choose. I mean, remember, you can take your path of integration to anything you want. You can have peaks of various sizes as the various kappas. So near kappa will take the part of the integral and all that really will matter is the part very near kappa. So it doesn't terribly matter, and that will play a role in a second. What you do, so let's say that n is 100,000 as before and kappa is 3 fifths. Then once you go up to 3 fifths of 0.602, it won't really matter what you do here because you're far away from the singularity. It's much smaller. So this is kind of a local computation. And as a result, the, comp the contribution is not completely well defined. And I'll write that down. In a second, you have a little bit of choice, how you split it up. Now, if you want an exact formula, well, then you can't get it. Already Hardy and Ramanujan couldn't get it. What they did is they split up the integral by the method of minor and major and minor arcs. So roughly, they had a rule that if you take all the kappa with the denominator up to something like up to 20, then they had a rule how they would split up the whole arc. It, they would take each of the kappas with those denominators, that's a finite set, and associate to each one of arcs of a certain length, and then take something and uh, just cut it off and roughly estimate the 
the error when they got to the end of the arc. And then the sum of all those errors, it was a very tricky analysis. I certainly wouldn't want to embark on it, and I certainly haven't done it for s equals 2, nor do I know what you would get. But they were able to show that the sum of all the errors they made by cutting off each thing, the sum of all of those, if they took all the denominators up to h, uh, went to 0 as h went to infinity. So they actually got an exact formula in the limit, which they didn't expect. But at the very least, they could expect that they would get the leading term to all orders, but much more than that, that the subleading terms coming from other kappas would be, not subleading, but the other contributions of other kappa would be important. So here, I'm not going to go into that. It's going to be a purely formal argument. I'll just describe uh, asymptotically with all the terms coming from the neighborhood of a given kappa. So roughly, this is what we're doing. And so we have to remember what the formula was for PS near the point E of kappa. And I could just put e to the minus x, but in the formulas, it was convenient to call the variable minus 1 to the t to the s, where t is going to infinity. Let's say through positive real numbers, but remember when we actually did it, you could go at an angle, like a, you know, uh, argument 1, 5 degrees or something, and then you also got a perfectly good uh, thing. So the formula that I gave last time, well, I gave the first time uh, experimentally, I mean, we're doing a lot of calculations for for instance, for s equals 2 and kappa with denominator 5. And then last time I explained how you can actually prove things. Uh, I used the, so I gave the following formula for PS of E of k. It's a constant, which is not terribly important, but I'll write down what it is. I mean, it is important, of course, when you do the calculations. So if this cal constant is 3, or if it's 7, then the corresponding calculation, uh, contribution will be 7 thirds as big. So of course, when you add up the contribution, you have to know the constant. But as far as the orders of magnitude, it's irrelevant. And what it was was the product of a root of unity, which was e to the 2 pi i times generalized Dedekind sum. But actually, I'm going to concentrate on s equals 2. And that general Dedekind sum was 0 whenever s was even because of some parity. So you can actually ignore that. But in general, in the case of Hardy and Ramnuchan, for s is 1 and also if s were 3 or 5, there would be this root of unity. And then there's still a factor which is ns of the denominator of kappa. So for instance, if s is 1, this is simply the denominator of kappa divided by 2 pi and the whole thing to the s over 2. But I'm just putting that for completeness. I gave it last time. It's, it's not important except that you have to know that there, that there is a constant that we know what it is. And then here it's e to the minus uh, uh, 1 over t to the s over 2. So that would be e to the minus the square root of x. Excuse me. No, I think it's e to the minus t to the s over 2. It's simply the square root of, of x, if I called that number x. And then the important part, it grows exponentially in t. And then there's a very unimportant part, but I have, I have to write it or it wouldn't be correct, say it of minus s times, again, t to the... Uh, uh, minus. This is it's very confusing to write 1 over t to the s. Let me write t to the minus s. This would be the same t to the minus s. But t is very big, so this is small. And the only effect of this, zeta, anyway, it won't have any effect when s is 2, because then zeta of minus 2 is 0. When s was 1, this was uh, minus a 24th. And when you put it to the other side, and put it into the integral, the effect it has, I'll write it down in a second, is just a shift n to n minus a 24th. So there's always a shift at n, where you shift n by a half zeta of minus s. But as I said, for s equals 2, that's not important. But this one is very important. This is important. And, uh, and therefore, you see here that if c s of cap is big, this thing is exponentially big, but a big exponential. If c s is positive but small, it's still exponentially big but much smaller. And so the order in which the various terms will contribute will de depend on this Cs of, of k. And Cs of k, uh, there's a formula. Cs of kappa, I gave uh, Cs of kappa, excuse me, I said it last time, is 1 over C times the sum over all congruence uh, residue classes L modulo C of Li2, Li, uh, I better copy the formula because something happened my notes, and I can't read it. So I'll copy it from 
open the official source. It's in my notes from last time. I guess I gave it then. Sorry, this is, I, what I started to write down was just for C equals one. CS of kappa, there's a factor gamma of one plus one over S, which for S equals one is just one divided by C, and then the sum L modulo C, and then the polylogarithm function with index one plus one over S of E to the two pi I, and then L to the S times kappa. So if S is one, then well gamma of two is just one, so it's one over C times the sum L modulo C, L I now is just integer argument, L I two of E, but now it's just L times kappa. And now it doesn't matter what kappa is because kappa is denominator, C is always the denominator of kappa. Kappa is some A over C, where A and C are co-prime. So here it doesn't matter what kappa is because it's some A over kappa, it's A prime to kappa, is L runs over all residue class multiple C, then A L also runs over all residue classes, and so you just get the sum over all L multiple C. So this is the same as the sum over all Li2, but it ended by a trivial argument, it's Li2 of one over C squared. So this is Z of two, pi squared over six, divided by C squared. So in the case when S is one, this thing only depends on C, in an extremely simple way. But in the case when C is not one, then that isn't true at all, and that's what's going to create all the fun. So, and I already mentioned that on the first lecture and the second when I gave the special cases. If I take, for instance, a fifth or minus a fifth, in that case it's the same, it's about 0 0.440. But if I take the other, still with S equals two, the other two points, rational numbers with denominator five, that's plus or minus two over fifths, then this is minus 0 0.026. So it's a more than 10 times smaller, but it has the opposite sign, which means that at these two points, P2 will actually be extremely small and will contribute nothing at all to the final asymptotics. So it's, it's, it's very erratic, whereas in the case, uh, in the hardy Ramanujan case, each C contributed, uh, I mean, sorry, each point with denominator C contributes something of the same order of magnitude as all of the others. And this numerical comp thing with the, this for instance, this only depends on the denominator, this depends on DS, but it's a root of unity. So the orders of magnitude were all the same. Of course, when you added them up, then you know, things could happen. So that's uh, the reason already that, that things will be a bit different. But actually, I'm jumping ahead of myself because I wanted to tell how this integral looks. So remember, the integral that we're looking at, this PS of K, is going to be the integral, the same integral that is written here, but I only take the part of the integral near some kappa. So I'm going to have some little part of the path near kappa. And so let me go back to the left of the board and erase and start again. So what, what you actually get is that, so if we put this, maybe this part I should put here, but the other part, uh, that formed for CS, little CS doesn't matter. So if I insert this formula into that, then I find that PS kappa of N, so the contribution to the number of partitions of n and s powers coming from the rational point C is roughly the, well, this, this silly constant, which is you know, known, but just uh, some small number, some simple number. So then there's the one over two pi coming from the Cauchy integral. There's an s, because of a change of variables, it should really be dq, but the q has a t to the s because of this change of variables. So don't worry about such details. And then remember I told you that I have to make a shift n is n minus, sorry, plus a half, zeta of minus s. So in the hardy Ramanujan case, z, s was one, zeta of minus one is minus a twelfth, and it was n minus a twenty-fourth, and anybody's ever seen the famous hardy Ramanujan form, it's the sum of terms, and each term has square roots of n minus a twenty-fourth. There's the shift. For s equals two, we don't have to worry about it. Uh, so if s is two, 
then as already said, well, say n of minus 2 is 0, so n tilde is just n. So you can forget the tilde. And then independent of s, it's to the minus 3 halves. And then the important part is a transcendental function that does depend on s. And then it will come, there'll be this constant, which is, that's remember the important one, this cs of k. And then after you make a change of variables, it'll be n tilde to the power minus 1 over s. So this is a constant depending on your rational number. And as n goes to infinity, and tilde also goes to infinity, it's just equal to n plus a constant, then you have smaller and smaller arguments. So we're uh, interested in this. Wait a second. Something has gone wrong. Sorry, uh, it's not divided by its times. Uh, there's been a change of very, uh, change of sign, the way that I defined hs, it's cs of kappa times n to the 1 over s. So n is very big, and so that's going to be the final formula. OK? So now I have to, but what is h? So if you look at that integral, then I can tell you what h is, but it's not well defined. You have a choice. So you see, if you look at this, then remember we were integrating near kappa along some path. and so. If I take a slightly different path just from that one contribution, deforming a path doesn't change anything in the in a Cauchy integral. It's only a, a, a homotopy class. So the only question is what you do away from kappa. Do you go all the way to I infinity? Do you start going up? Do you, you know, curl your mustaches up a bit? Or do you go down? Or do you circle zero? So you know, how do I close it up? Do I do something like this? Or do I do something like maybe this? Or do I do something like? Maybe close it up all the way to a circle, or maybe I close it up like this. So there are various contours you could put. And the original function, you can't do in the lower half plane, because this product, which I've erased, product 1 over 1 minus q to the n diverges. But of course, the contribution near tau, it's a purely exponential function, e to the cs of k. There's, that doesn't have any problem crossing any lines. So I can play with this contour. And I did that. It was several hours of work. And I haven't even written the details in, the, uh, in my write-up, which I'll make available very soon if anybody wants to see it, uh, because it didn't matter. There are, by making the various choices, you get uh, at least three versions of this function h of x, uh, h s of x, all the same. And I can check this numerically very carefully up to exponentially small terms. The thing is exponentially big, exponentially small terms, because it, it's, well, I'll show you an example in a second for s equals 1, and you'll see the kind of thing that you can change. And it makes no difference at all for the asymptotic formula unless somebody in the future can do a full Rademacher analysis. Rademacher made the right choice of h for s equals 1, different from the one Hardy and Roman Mitchell made. And then you could make an infinite sum. The infinite sum converged and gave the exact thing. But I certainly don't know how to do that here. And it definitely, as far as I know, hasn't been done. So these, which choice you make would be important if you were able to do the full analysis. But we aren't anywhere. Anyway, so there are three uh, choices when you do the thing. And they're actually very pretty. So I called them HSA of x. I'll call them just a, b, and c. So each of them is a contour integral. But then you can move. The contour integral has a pole. There's a 1 over t somewhere. And remember that there will. This e to the minus n t, remember, tau is related to t by this. When you work it all out, there's a pole term. You cross, and you pick up a residue. And the, you have some exponential. And you pick up a, you expand it as a sum, take the sum of the residues. And you get a very, very rapidly convergent expansion. So the simplest one is the following very nice function. So you take this as obviously convergent for all x and c. It's an entire function. If s is 1, this is r factorial times gamma of r minus 1 half, which is up to a trivial factor is gamma of 2r. And so this was uh, essentially like uh, e to the square root of x, or, or sinh of x, or cos of x. If x is 2, then you have r factorial times gamma of r minus 1 half. So that's a Bessel function, a k Bessel function, or some sort of a Bessel function if r is 2. And if r is, sorry, no, it's not. That would be r over 2, r over 2. Sorry, if, 
if S is uh, two, it's a, it's a generalized Bessel function. So it's some kind of a Bessel function. But as I said, you have a choice. And there are two other versions which are not particularly more complicated. This one, you take the same, you take only Rs. Here it's Rs factorial. And here it's gamma of R minus a half. And you multiply by S. And so you see what you've done to go from A to B is every S term I've counted S times, and the others I've omitted. But since these terms for, you know, will, will start out very comparably small and then very big, and you're going to be adding up zillions of them, and at the high point, it's very, very uniform. It's a sum. So if, you, if S is, for instance, 3, and then you take every third term and multiply by 3, you get the same to exponentially small orders by Poisson as you would. So that these are essentially the same as clear, but still they're different functions. So when you actually do it, you get different numbers. And the third version is, again, very simple, uh, very similar. I have to write it down because I certainly don't remember by heart. So it's the same with this s, but here it's rs plus 3 halves s. So there's a shift. And then here it's r factorial times gamma of rs plus 3s over 2 plus 1. And that comes out if you do the integral in some other, uh, if, if you deform the contour into some other position. So depending how you can deform the contour. But the asymptotics of these will always be the same. And the reason is when you have this path, what you always do is steepest descent. So you take your function of t, which is the function I wrote here, and it's a completely elementary function. This part you can forget, it's very small. So this is essentially x of a constant times t minus a power of t. So it's cs of kappa times t minus ts over 2. And so you take the places where the, uh, where the real part of that is, uh, is constant, that stationary phase, so that the oscillations there cancel out. It's what you're always doing this kind of thing. And that tells you the part of the integral that can contributes the most, exactly like you do in quantum field theory when you have an integral, a path integral, and you look at the place where the oscillations stop. So you'll look near the maximum. And so, and then you follow that steepest descent for a long time. So to get the asymptotics to all orders, you follow that path for a while. But eventually that path, you know, it, it won't, it, it might cross the line. You can do all kinds of things. And then you have, as I say, some choice how you close it up, and that leads to these different formulas. I don't want to go into that. Uh, also, that I, I thought about this several months ago. I don't even remember the details. But these were three of the functions you gave. But it's, as I said, it made no difference. But now for comparison, so the formula that you get is always the same one. It's the one that I wrote here, that the contribution to PS of n of a single rational number is up to some prefactor, this transcendental function of, let's say n is, so I'll just take the case n equals 2. This would be this C2 of kappa times square root of n. So it's roughly some exponential, it turns out, in the cube root of n. But the constant in the exponential depends on c2 of kappa. So that's the important thing. And the exact function will be one of these functions. Uh, so just uh, for completeness, let me tell you what the asymptotics are in the case when uh, if s is 2, I'm actually my choice. I have to make a choice, as I said. And it will be the function h2 of x and c version, although it doesn't really matter, if x is positive and 0 if x is negative. Actually, if real part of x is positive and negative. And the reason is you're doing Cauchy integral. In one sign, the, the place of steepest descent would be above the line. And you can go off to infinity and you get 0. So it's only, in, it's only for one sign that you get a contribution. Again, that's a detail, because these terms where x is negative would be, even if you took h2c, would be extremely small. Uh, so it, it doesn't really matter how you, how you cut it off. But that's the actual functions I took. And so just for curiosity, I can tell you the exact asymptotics for large arguments. But the formula is ugly if you call h2 of x. So I'll call h2 of 2x to the 3 halves, because then it looks nicer. And this you can prove in several ways. Either there's an integral representation or from the ODE, or there are various ways. So it's x e to the 3x over the square root of 12 pi times 1 minus 17 over 36x minus 35 over 2,592x squared, and so on. 
And if you took not H2C, but H2A or H2B, all terms of this expansion would be the same. The difference is something exponentially small. It would be with e to the minus 3x. So that's why it doesn't really matter. And here, by the way, you see that this x is x, but this x is x to the 3x. So this x is roughly the 2 thirds power of the argument. And the argument here was n to the 1 half. And so the 2 thirds power of n to the 1 half is n to the 1 third, which is what I told you at the beginning. So I would like to say a word more about this, because it's, I think this is very amusing. Already in the S equals 1 case, which is the one we know, Hardy and Ramanujan, as I said, used one H, and Hardy and Radma, uh, not Hardy, just Radma alone, used another H. And so you can say, well, which one was it? Was it A, B, or C? And so the answer is quite amusing. Uh, so for, for S equals 1, Uh, Hardy and Ramanujan used, so I can call it H1, but it's the Hardy-Ramanujan function, and it's very elementary. It's the square root of x over constant, which is 2 squared of pi, but then if you don't shift by half, you don't get exponential accuracy at all, e to the 2 square root of x. But now this, you see, is very big if x is big. But as you sum the x, has a 1 over c in it. And if x gets very small, this function is not particularly small. It's, it's a constant. But Rademacher changed it by using a slightly different contour. And he used a different version of h1, which is the same to all orders, because, well, here you can see the order. It's just an exponential factor. So his function was square root of x minus a half over the square root of pi without the 2 times the cinch hyperbolic sine of 2 squared of x. So since of x when x is big is 1 half e to the x, well, for every x, it's 1 half e to the x minus 1 half e to the minus x. That means it differs by something exponentially small from this. So the big term is at no effect at all. But in the infinite sum, x goes to 0, and then this thing is, is going slowly to 0 because of the square root of x, whereas this one isn't. And so his sum became convergent, and not only converged, it gave the right answer. But now you could say, OK, so that's the ones that historically the two important functions. And I've given you three. So which of my three functions, HA, HB, and HC, are these? And the only reasonable thing is one of them is hardy Ramanujan, and one is Radermach, and the other is something else. But no, it's not like that at all. In fact, H1A, in this case, is equal to the square root of x times sinh of 2 square root of x minus a half times cosh of 2 square root of x, again divided by square root of pi. And h1b is not different, it's the same. And h1c is the square root of x times cosh of 2 square root of x minus a half sinh. And when you just calculate these series, it's completely elementary. And so they're all different from both H1 Hardy Ramanujan and H1 Radumacher. So we have three, we have two old functions, two new ones. You would assume the three new ones, you'd assume the three new ones is the two old ones and the new one, but the three new ones are actually only two new ones because two of them coincide with, not for other s, but for s equals one. And none of them are the same as the ones that were used before. But you can see that they're all the same. Singe and Kosh are both e to the x to r multiply something exponentially small. So all of these are equal to both of those multiply the same e to the minus 2 squared of x. And they're all linear combinations, basically, of each other. I mean, any two of them span the whole, span the whole same space. And similarly, any three for s equals 2 and so on. I mean, there's kind of a nice differential equation, I think. Anyway, here it's certainly true. So that's uh, some discussion of the nature of the transcendental functions. But now, as I said, comes the uh, really uh, surprising thing, except it's no longer such a surprise because I've mentioned it several times, which is when you now make these contributions and you start adding them up, they're very, very erratic. And the reason I already explained that in the case S equals 1, which is the classical case, C1 of cap, if cap is A over C, denominator C, is simply Z of 2 over the denominator square. It only depends on the denominator. But for already for S equals 2 and for all other S, it de depends very much on the actual number. What's important 
Well, I just erased it all. Well, I didn't really erase it because there was an HS. What's important is the size of this and really the real part because it's an exponential. And, but here, these two numbers happen to be real. One was positive and one was negative. So near a fifth and four fifths, meaning near the standard two fifths of unity, you know, e to the two pi to the fifth in here, it blew up like a certain exponential. And near the other two fifth roots of unity, it actually went exponentially down like a different exponential, quite a bit smaller, but now with a negative exponent. So now you get uh, you know, wildly different contributions. And that means that the story is much more complicated. So let me, again, give you the numerics, because this whole course is about asymptotics, but very much also about numerics. And the fun of asymptotics is that you actually get, get numbers. So, in the, so the point four is the dependence. Remember, I'm giving all the places where the story is different for s bigger than one than it was for s equals one. The dependence on kappa, which is some number where the a doesn't, and it's just notation, but the c is the denominator. So before that, when s was one, it only depended on c, and it went down as c grow, grew in a very uniform way. So if, if s equals one, uh, I already said that the c2, c1 of kappa is simply pi squared over six over c squared. And so here, if I take the number uh, p, p of 200, remember they were using, and I take the total contribution of all points of denominator c to this big number, then if I take, uh, I'm not sure my, I'll have to write quite small because I, I wanted to go up to eight. Uh, the biggest term, uh, when you compute it to high accuracy, it's very easy. We use that h, it doesn't matter now if I use Rademacher or, um, or hardy Ramanujan because the number is huge. So the contribution here is a number very close to the true answer. And if I changed whether I used H1 Hardy Ramanujan or A, B, or C, I would change this by you know, 3 to the minus 12 here. You wouldn't see it at all. So the here, it doesn't really, that's why I said it's not really important. It looks important, but it's not important exactly how you define that function. Then for C equals 2, it's much smaller. So this is 3 billion. The next term is only 36,000. So they, they decrease extremely rapidly. The next term, C equals 3, is already only 90. I'm not going to put the dot, dot, dot each time. The next term is only 5. The next term is 1.424. The next is 0 0.071. The next is exactly 0. So some of this is a cancellation. And the next term is 0. So for 7, there are several terms, but the exponential are some of the pre coefficients that although there are several terms of a certain order, their sum is actually identically zero. So you get these numbers, and the sum here of these I wrote out, so the sum of these up to denominator seven, uh, eight is uh, three, nine, seven, two, nine, 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 oh, two, nine, three, eight, seven, point, nine, seven, five, dot, 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 and remember, the true answer is 388. Well, it's an integer, so it stops. So you see we're within 0.025 of the answer to this absolutely gigantic number. And that's what Hardy and Ramanujan found, and where they were so happy that they'd never expected at all that their approximation could conceivably give that kind of accuracy. Already that the first term is so incredibly good, it gives you know, most, you know, more than half of the terms. The error is only 36,000. But the first three are down to an error of six. The first five, you're already at the nearest integer. So it's an incredibly accurate thing. But now, as I said, it's not like that at all when s is 2 because of this change. And when we instead do uh, uh, now if s is 2, it's completely different. Remember there, my test case was 100,000. So p2 of 10 to the fifth. And I gave the first, well, I'm going to give it again. Uh, I, I gave the first six in the last six digits so that you could sort of see the number. I didn't write it all out. So it was roughly 3.9 times 10 to the 59. So now I again make a similar table. I'll just do it up to five. And then I'll give the total contribution of all points 
all rational points cap of that denominator. So here it'll be zero, here it'll be a half, here it'll be a third and minus a third, here a quarter and minus a quarter, and here are four values, one, two, three, or four over five. So the total contribution, the sum of the uh, P2 of uh, 10 to the five, and I'll just give it to two, uh, two significant digits. So uh, there's a main term, which just as for Hardy and Ramanujan, was, is already extremely near to the right answer. So here, this was correct. The error was only 36,000. Here, the first term is 3.9 times 10 to the 59. The second term is, well, the 1.8 doesn't matter. It's the, it's the power of 10 that matters. It's 10 to the 26. So then you think, well, 10 to the 33, we, it's more than half of the previous exponent. So we've more than halved the thing. And then the next term is even a lot better. So this is you know, very, very, so this is already much nearer now. So in other words, if you include these two terms, you're already, uh, you'll already be you know, very good. So sorry, much smaller. I mean, this contribution is much smaller. Then the next one is only minus 2,000. So it's very small compared. We're talking about 10 to the 60. And 2,000 is nothing. But now comes the surprise, if I hadn't already kind of given it away. When you get to C equals 4, then it's much bigger, quite a bit bigger, than the C equals 2 term. And then when you go to 5, again, it's much smaller, but still much bigger than the C equals 3 term. It's 10 to the 15 rather than 10 to the 3. So it's you know, wildly varying. And that's completely different from what you saw here, where the terms are going uniformly in size to 0. I mean, one happens to be zero in the next because you're adding up positive and negative terms, but the size, the number of digits, goes you know, very, very smoothly along a smooth curve. And here it's not like that at all. So in fact, the biggest contribution here, I'll give the details in a second. The biggest contribution, if you continue, I only gave the first four, is from C equals four, which means kappa is plus or minus a quarter, denominator four, and zeta, the corresponding root of unity, is i or minus i. I could just put plus or minus i. OK. So those, that's the biggest contribution. And that means, if that were the only contribution, remember the contribution always has, I think I erased it now, but the contribution, I did erase it, it had an i to the 2 pi, e to the 2 pi i times uh, kappa times n, or actually times n tilde of it. That's just a shift of n by constant, times this hs, and then there was a, a pre-constant, this little c cat. But it depends in an oscillatory way on kappa n. So you have to add them. So if kappa is a quarter, then that means that each the 2 pi times kappa n is period 4. But since kappa is not just some integer over 4, but an odd integer over 4, it's not an exactly 4, it means even more. Not only does period 4, it is anti-period 2. When you change n by 2, you change the sign. So let me give you a little table. So it's roughly, I mean, asymptotically, it's anti-invariant. When you shift your n, I mean, n is a large number, when you shift by 2, uh, so here, if you take the hardy ramanujan if you take this, this was n equals 200. But if you made a table of this, and next to it, I had the corresponding table for 201, 202, 203. Then the first row, the next row, would be very close to this. It's a slowly vanishing, varying function. But the next row here, the next one would be minus 36,000, because it's a, this, a slowly varying function, which is roughly 36,000, times minus 1 to the n. It depends on n mod 2. And the next term, there'd be three values depending on n mod 3, here depending n mod 4. But now the most important contribution is this fourth one, so it depends on n mod 4. So to make that come to life, I hope, let me make a little table. So I'll give the total error. So I take P2 of why did I write delta 2 of n is the value of p2 of n minus the main contribution from cap equals 0. And so here I'll just put the number delta of 10 to the of 100,000. And since they're all of the same order 10 to the 32, and I don't want to have to write it nine times, uh, uh, 
12 times, I think. Uh, I'll just put, I'll divide by 10 to the 32. So let me take here the numbers. Sorry, excuse me. This is going to be delta n, but I am dividing them all for convenience by 32. And so I'm going to take 10 to the 5 plus, and I'll take 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So I'm giving you a table of 12 successive values, but I'm grouping them, 4 and then the next 4, because then you can see what's happening. And so when you do this, what you find is that the terms are very, very similar and growing in a smooth way. Here you add 10, here you add 9, but subtract. Uh, that's for 0, 4, and 8. But then if you take 1, 5, and 9, you get 1.371 minus 1.375 minus 1.379. But now here you get numbers that again are positive, and they're almost the negative of this. And similarly, the last column is then again 1.373. Remember, this 1.373 is really times 10 to the 32. I didn't want to write it 100 times, well, 12 times. So that's the table. And you can see that if you fix n is 0 mod 4, 1 mod 4, 2 mod 4, 3 mod 4, then it's just a very slowly varying function. That's the h2 term. But the prefactor depends on f mod 4, but it changes sign. This minus 8.3 becomes plus 8.3. This minus 1.4. 37 becomes plus 1.37. So that's, uh, so now you get this rather strange phenomenon. And so this is what I just showed you, that the contributions in this case, 10 to the 5, from denominator 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, they vary wildly in their size. And the biggest contribution is always C equals 1. But the next biggest is C equals 4. So in fact, for, uh, so the reason is, again, if I look at kappa and C2 of kappa, then if I make a table, now I'm going to order these by, well, I'm ordering the kappa, but by the real part of C2. So this C2 you can calculate to any number of digits. It's just I gave the form before. It's the sum of dialog rooms. And so I'll give a little piece of the table. At 0, it's 2.315. At plus or minus a quarter, that's the biggest one, it's 1.038 plus or minus 0.383i. Well, I prepared the table all the way up to so this is the first eight. I'm not going to copy up the whole table. Anybody who wants can ask for a copy of the paper. It'll be on my web page in a few days. I haven't yet put it on because I'm still changing one or two formulas that are in misprints. So if you take the first eight, come in a rather strange order. Well, I can tell you what the next ones are. Actually, I was going to do it, at least the numbers. So the next one after a quarter is a half. So it's worse than a quarter, but bigger than everybody else. The next three are the ones with denominator 9, but with numerator 1, 4, or 7, not 2, 5, or 8. They give a very small contribution. And then the next ones, so maybe I'll take this number away and just give you the, the actual numbers. The next one is plus or minus a fifth, an, an eighth. Then here it's plus or minus 1 or 9 over 16. And then the next one is plus or minus 1, 4, 6, 9, or 11 over 25. And the next one I already wrote is plus or minus a third. So they come in a kind of a weird order, and I just wrote that one. So they're, they, they, this is the order of the contributions in principle for a given n. Now, when you do it for a particular n, like 200, it can change slightly because, for instance, these three the three contributors are of the same order, but the C2 are exactly the same number. Okay? And when you add up the contributors, they cancel exactly. They give zero, just like we had one for Hardy Ramanujan. So the actual size of the contributions for 200,000 is again the weird order. And I'm going to give a little more because it actually shows something. So the biggest uh, 17 contributions. So for each C, I add up all the contributions for that C uh, for n equals for P2 of 10 to the fifth, which is our standard example, are in order 1, as I said, is always the biggest. 4 was the next biggest, then 2 we had here. Then you would think it's 9 and then 8, but as I told you, 9 actually cancels completely. It contributes 0, the main term. 
So eight, then 16, three, 25, 12, then comes five, 24, 32, 48, uh, 40, 64, 20, 96, and 17. The, the actual numbers play no role. This is you know, a lot of computation to find in what order they contribute. And this is what you find. So those are the first 17. And their, uh, and their total contribution is what it should be, which is P2 of 10 to the fifth, which remember was around 3.9 times 10 to the 15, uh, minus approximately 8.3 times 10 to the 13. So what you're missing, if you take these first four, uh, 17 contributions, we're st not at all down to the nearest integer. It's hard in Ramanujan where we just five terms, but we're down to 10 to the 13, which sounds like a big number. Uh, sorry, this was uh, 59. So we're comparing with almost 10 to the 60. It's you know, almost 10 to the 50 times smaller. So the first roughly 50 digits, 47 digits are correct. However, so then you say, great, so I just continue. But the next few C, the next C in order, that's why I wanted to actually give the numbers, because this is the actual cutoff point where it no longer helps. You might think, OK, I'll just take some more C, and I'll get closer and closer. It's happened not at all. The next C, in order at least, or I'll just give the next few, are 80, 56. There's a tendency that highly factored numbers contribute a bit more. You see here 32, 48, 40, 64. They're not quite random, but I also don't you know. They're not quite systematic either. I can't read my handwriting, so I'm not sure if that's a 13. I think it is. But, but all give much smaller contributions, like you know, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9. And there are only a handful of them, I mean 5. And then after that, they're yet smaller. So 5 times 10 to the 9 doesn't begin to eat up the 10 to the 13. So roughly, when you add this 17, it's still better than this 17. It's better than if you stopped here. This error is a bit smaller than it was. It was 10 to the 14, now it's 10 to the 13. But if you continue and take the next five, it remains 8.3. In fact, the next three digits are the same, 8.295 or whatever, times 10 to the 13. It doesn't go down anymore. We're missing something. And so that's the, the last point. Wait, I started at 2, and I go to 3.30, and it's 1 minute to 3, so I'm OK. I can't subtract. Uh, so I'm, I'm still OK on time. Uh, I don't think I'll use up the full half an hour, but at least I'm not going to go over. So, uh, you know, you might think, well, what's going, what's going wrong now? And of course, there are several possibilities. One is that I made a mistake, numerical mistakes, and I assure you I made plenty as I did these calculations along the way, but I ended up checking everything six, you know, against each other. So I hope there aren't any, but I can't guarantee. It could be that the theory is just wrong and that it, what is called for the experts the minor arcs. So you break up the circle into the major arcs, which are open intervals of the appropriately chosen size around all rational numbers of small denominator. Of course, every denominator is small. Everything is relative to n. So you go up to some size. For Hardy and Ramanuja, the denominator went up to the fourth root of n. And then you take the, uh, intervals around that. And then the minor arcs is what happens, so to speak, in between. And so it could be that they're having a big contribution. And for all I know, that still is true. But in fact, it's much more interesting. So now comes the, the fifth point. And to me, by far the most fun of the whole thing, because it, it really means that the circle method, uh, in terms of you'd say, see how it's in sich. It really has some extra pizzazz that the one for s equals 1 doesn't have. So now I come to the, as I say, the last point, especially if I can read my notes. So the, the most subtle point. So remember what the big difference is between s equals 1 and all other s. The, the circle method, um, the asymptotics, euler maclaurin kind of worked the same way. But what was very different is that if s is 1, then the function a to s of tau, which was essentially 1 over p s, which was just the dedicated a to function, is a modular function. Modular, well, a modular form of way to have. So it, it transforms in a well-defined way under the modular group. So remember that a to s, well, a to of tau, for instance, is q to the 1 24th divided by p1 of q. And in general, a to s is q to the 
minus a half, say, of minus s divided by ps of q. So the size of ps of q is essentially the same. So that means 8 of tau itself, well, 8 of tau inverse is what we want, starts q to the minus of 24th plus q to the 23 over 24 plus q plus 2q to the 47 over 24, et cetera. The coefficients here are just the partition function, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, uh, uh, 7, et cetera. But the exponents are minus the 24th, minus the 24th plus 1, minus the 24th plus 2. All of this is exponentially small as tau goes to infinity. So that, but that would be the same for a to s. a to s of tau would also be, uh, in this case, there's no power of q, so d1, I can't do it in my head, plus q plus, I mean, it also would have an expansion. That's not what changes. But the change is when I take gamma of tau. So tau is going to some kappa, which is, and gamma is some element such that gamma of tau is going to infinity. So if you write, and we did this before, I'm not going to write down the formula. So this is, so up to a stupid factor, which is something like the square root of tau minus kappa, as kappa goes to infinity. When you transform tau, an element of SL2z to go to infinity, uh, here, because of the multivariate, you get a factor square root of tau minus kappa, or one over square root of tau minus kappa, and then what you get is exactly the same expansion. So the, the nature of the expansion, uh, and here q is no longer e to the 2 pi i tau, but it's e of 2 pi times gamma of tau. But gamma of tau is now going to infinity. And so again, all of these terms are exponentially small. And so the function itself had only one exponentially big term. And it's that term that when we multiplied by the remaining thing in the circle formula, gave the Bessel-like function because it was the product of two exponentials. And one of them was this very big exponential. And then the later terms won't contribute. But now let's look what happens when s is not 1. Well, we gave the formula. In, I gave it last time. Well, I gave it the first time numerically, for instance, near fifth, and then uh, last time proving. And so the formula is not like that at all now. Instead, what we'll find now for s uh, equals to, uh, 2, for instance, the same for any other, we find that p2 of s at a, cap, uh, at a root of unity, which is e to the 2 pi kappa times e to the 1 over t squared. See, when you transform the function, I gave the exact formula another time. It turned into a sum of functions where you had, for instance, a to 2 of minus 1 over tau with the product roughly up to a simple factor like square root of tau of a to the square root of tau. I think it was square root of tau and i times the square root of tau with index a half. So there were two different terms, but each of them had an exponential product. And when you do it at other seeds, you'll always have a sum of terms. So in general, if I take a to s or p s of e to kappa, I'll have a sum of terms e to the something exponentially big. That's just like here. Here, this is e to the 1 24th of something, then minus 23 over 24th. But here, the expansion, only one of those exponents is positive. All the others are next. Negative, and so the whole thing can be replaced by a single exponential. But here, uh, it, it was an infinite sum, but the exponents eventually went to minus infinity, so it was convergent. But that means that finitely many of them are negative, are positive. So you'll have finitely many terms, but not just one. Sometimes there are none. Remember, I told you that at two fifths, it starts e to a negative number, negative times t. So the whole thing is exponentially small. At plus a fifth, it's a positive number. So it's e to a positive number times t. It's exponentially big. But then there's the second term. That second term happens at a fifth to be also exponentially small, so we can ignore it. So there's only one term that contributes here and none that contribute here. But when you get to a ninth, then you have the one term that's exponentially big, but the next term is still exponentially big. And then the other terms are, have negative exponents. So you get a finite number of contributions from each one. 
So I'll actually write the form. The, the details don't matter, but just so you see it. You'll get a sum. So we have this number n2 of c, which is the smallest interest square is this by c, divided by 2 pi n to the 3 halves. All of this is just Cupid factors, then e to the 2 pi of minus n kappa. And now comes uh, a complicated mess. And I'll write it out just for completeness. But the point is uh, only the structure of it. So I'm going to go from the set uh, so I'm going to go, uh, I'm, I'll have the function x kappa. And x, I'll call kappa again a over c, as I've been doing, is the set of pairs Lm, where L is a residue class modulus c, m is an integer different from 0, and they're linked by L squared a is congruent to m mod c. OK, so that's some infinite set. So, um, and then I'll take all functions, mu, from this into z greater than or equal to 0. But they're only finitely, uh, well, so there are many of these, but only finitely many will contribute. I'll show you why in a second. And then here we have e to the 2 pi times some number, which depends on cap and, and on this function mu, over c. So that's a root of unity. And then the exponential that we're used to. But this, what I called c to a cap before was just the leading term when mu is the 0 function. But now we have different exponents. But we only care about the ones where c2, so only finitely many terms. So there exist only finitely many of these functions mu, such that this c2, which I'll write down in a second just so you've seen it, uh, such that the real part of this is, is bigger than 0, bigger than or equal to 0. So it's going to be a finite sum of positive exponentials. But it's a mess, because it's a whole, even the indexing set of that sum is not just something simple. It's pairs, L and M, but they're only finitely many, believe me, where this thing is positive, and then multiplied by some root of unity. So I'll give the formulas just for fun, or not for fun. It's not very, it's not really fun at all, but just so you, for completeness. So we have this function mu, and I sum over all L, M in this set, uh, but it'll be a finite sum. OK, some mu of L, M, L, and then C2 of kappa mu will actually be C2 of kappa because I've, I've shifted things somewhere. Don't ask me too many details because I copied this all from the paper, and it's a mess. 2 pi over C to the 3 halves times the sum again over this set X kappa, which the sums are called L, M. And then the actual, it's the same mu. And then it's multiplied by m minus i times the square root of m. So m can be positive or negative, so uh, that's whatever it is, over the square root of 2m. The actual form doesn't matter at all. This is a real number. This is a rational, well, this is an integer. So this is c through root of unity. And this is some real number, or maybe it's a complex number. It's a complex number. But as I said, there are only finitely many that are going to contribute. And so now, when I put this into the formula, then I'll find that the total contribution to kappa is not the one that I told you before. I was always just taking the leading term, which was the one with the C2 of, of kappa. I don't know quite, I don't quite believe the C2 of kappa minus, maybe it is that. Well, let's say it's correct. Uh, but so the contribution will be that the full C2 of kappa of n will have a part P2 kappa of n 0. So this corresponds to the, the term that we had before, the leading term. And then I'll just call, I call everything else, you know, plus uh, everything else. So uh, that's, this means that mu is that function mu, which is, takes on non-negative values, is 0, or here it's not the 0 function. So the 0 term will be kind of usually the main term. And this thing will be the sum. Uh, do I have to write the whole thing again? I think I do. So it's got the same 
prefactor, of course, that doesn't change. Wait, I'm doing something wrong. This can't have been right because there is no n here. So I don't know what I did here. There's no n here. There's an n. Uh, it's completely unimportant. The only important, so here I have the same L of kappa mu over C. But now I have my same transcendental function that remember was something like sinh of x in the hardy Ramanujan case, sinh of squared of x. It's this function h2 of c2 of k and mu, then times the square root of n. So before, I'd just written c2 of kappa times the square root of n, but there are actually many kappa comma mu. And I was only concentrating on mu equals 0. And so these, these extra terms, I say the details don't matter at all. And now when you do this, uh, things get much better. And there was still a very slight puzzle at the end, and I can't quite explain it. Could be a numerical mistake. So now I'll end with numerical ex example. Once again, well, s is always 2 now. n is, again, 10 to the fifth. And the biggest contributions, if kappa, if you remember an earlier table, I told you if kappa was 1, 4, 7, or 9, then these had the, the biggest, or rather big, C2 of kappa. But for this particular value of n, the three constants cancel. So they, the main contribution, so the primary contributions of these kappas, so these are in the notation I've been using P2 kappa for these three kappa. Well, there are six kappa because it's up to sign. Uh, P2 kappa of 10 to the fifth. But the, the, the main contribution, zero, is approximately minus 3.39 times 10 to the 23, minus 1.15 times 10 to the 23, and plus 4.53 times 10 to the 23, so they're fairly big. Remember, we were missing 10 to the 13, but they add up to zero, exactly. And so that's why I've mentioned that before. They don't contribute anything. The, the terms were n equals 9. But the secondary contributions, but the secondary contributions, the P2 for the same kappa, or the plus, well, there's only one term. There are many terms, but here there are only two terms that are positive, the zeroth one and one other. And those three together give uh, uh, P2K of n for these. So it's actually six values of these. For these kappa, so C equals 9, do not give 0. And they give, in fact, 8.30 times 10 to the 13. And what we were missing before, so previously missing just using the top terms, was 8.26 times 10 to the 13. So you see the single contribution from C equals 9, but the secondary contribution, the second order exponential, which is still positive but much smaller than the biggest one, is giving something very much smaller than the main term. Well, it would have been 10 to the 23. It actually canceled. But now these 10 to the 13, there are three contributions. They don't cancel. And they give almost all that we're missing. And in fact, when you look here, what happens if C is 1 up to 7, there's no secondary term. So the C, so for those kappas, uh, the P2 kappa plus is simply zero. Remember, we defined the H2 to be identically zero as soon as the exponent was negative. So there are, for those cases, there's only one exponent and it's positive. So there's no contribution. For some they're all negative. But anyway, there are no, there's no secondary contribution. For C equals eight, there is uh, a secondary term. It's not zero, but they cancel. Exactly, just let these primary terms cancel for C equals 9. For C equals 9, I already told you the contributions were uh, 8.30 times 10 to the 13. The next most important ones are if C is 25 or 36, and this is of the order of 10 to the 11. So it's 100 times smaller, which means it's changing the second digit of the 8.30, but that's just we're missing. And the sum of these is now 8.25 times 10 to the 13. And what we were missing was 8.26 times 10 to the 13. So I felt pretty good. I have to admit, I then spent you know, like two days trying to get you know, more digits to see how far it would go. But whatever I did, the further terms are still much smaller. They no longer contribute. It's the same problems before. So I'm still, if I'm really honest, missing about a 10 to the 11 out of 10 to the 15. 
In fact, I have no idea where it came from. It's hard to believe that this 8.25, it should have been 8.26 is a coincidence. So I assume that, that there are numerical, small numerical mistakes somewhere that are creeping in and that it will give something to arbitrarily small orders. But there are several possibilities. I may have made a numerical mistake. The theory may be uh, completely wrong in some way that I don't see. It could be that, remember, I had a choice whether I used H2, A, B, or C. And I actually took H2 to be H2C. If something was positive and zero, if something was negative, then it could be that those terms, but I don't think so, because they're exponentially small. And my error is still 10 to the 11. Those should be like 10 to the minus something. So I don't think it's that. So it could be a mistake. It could be that the theory is wrong. It could be that the, you need a different H2. And the fourth is, of course, it could be a contribution to the minor arcs. I'm pretty sure that the true answer is the first one. Somewhere there's a small numerical hitch. Remember, we're already in the, well over the 50th digit compared to the original one, or roughly the 50th digit. Use a very, very high precision computation and it can easily go wrong. So the exact detail, I don't think every, anybody really cares about getting the exact number of partitions of 100,000 of the squares from an asymptotic formula. But the fact that the circle method has so much intrinsic number theory coming in and such a subtle behavior when it's not modular, I thought this was interesting enough to tell in quite some detail. So that's the end. Uh, now it's actually 12 minutes before the end of today, so I can stop earlier to certainly take questions. But that's all I'll say about this story. And as I say, next time will be completely separate, probably also not a full hour and a half. I, I don't think it's a, it's a nice story, but it's not that exciting. But it's one more quite different type of asymptotic question that one can ask. So I'll stop for today. Multiple questions, anybody here or uh, on Zoom? About either these three lectures or any of the previous ones. Emmanuel, yeah, I can always count on you for a question. Question. So, uh, so just as a curiosity, although you know this uh, sequence of contributions as you listed in one table, like the biggest contribution is from the first root of unity, one, right, and then uh, it came the i and minus i, the, which were related to the denominator four, and then the third one, I don't rem recall what it I was. I think that was a half. It was a half and yeah. so on. So you have a chaotic thing, so the first one, got to 10 to the 23 digits, and then uh, there was a 10 to the 32 coming later on, right? But I suppose, I mean, even when, when, with the status that you have now, of course, there is a, a threshold. I mean, of course, you can for surely say that the, the contributions which are way ahead in the table won't beat this 10 to the 32, right? You have a I, threshold. I did say that. And more than that, I told you that if I took the first, I wrote it out in detail. The first five, no, it's not on the board anymore. Let me write it very quickly without the mantis, I think it's called. So if three, four, five, then the confuse just the number of digits was 59. I'll just put the number 26, 3, 32, and 15. So the biggest contribution after the main term was yes. 10 to the 32. And then I gave the next ones, I, I gave a, a long list. I wrote it on the board, all 17, that probably people thought I was a bit nuts to give so much, maybe I was. But the main contribution in order for that n is were 1, then 4, then 2, then 8, then 16. I gave the first 17. And then this gave me an error of 8 times 10 to the 13. And then I said that if I take the next five, they're way smaller. But I went up to about 300. And they're all very much smaller, so much smaller than even if you add them up. And I'm actually convinced, but that's another place that it could have gone wrong. No. That I won't suddenly find, actually, when I went up to 1,000 in the end, I let the computer run for three days. All the further contributions were very, very much smaller. So there will, it will never happen that a later thing overcomes not just the 10 to the 32, but even the 10 to the 13. So after a while, I'm really left with an irreducible piece that I can't get rid of by more terms. But as far as, as far as the theoretical part goes, I mean, do you have, I mean. Yeah. You mean, can I estimate? Yeah, can yeah, you, can you give an upper bound for Can you actually prove mathematically no, that, that no contribution? That is what estimate means. It, it, I mean, estimate okay. means to prove that something is less than something not to be value. I think I certainly could, because if C is very large, then the size of the C2 of capital will eventually get smaller and smaller. And so whether it's positive, I don't know the exact arguments, but I, it's a sum of dialograms. The dialogram behaves very regularly. So I think I could. 
make a rigorous proof that if I take, let's say, so I went, I think, up to C is 1,000. And none of the Cs except these 17 affected this number in any way, shape, or form. They were much smaller, like less than 10 to the 8. Uh, I think I can prove that after 1,000, all of the contributions will be less than this, just by estimating the dialogue. I didn't bother to do it because it's not that interesting. We're only talking about one number. N is, we're only talking about the case S is 2 and N is 10 to the 5th. But in principle, for any given one, you could say if, if you take very large C compared to N, it will be negligible. But the problem is that the small C are jumping up and down. There, there's no way that you could see, for instance, why is this so ridiculously much further, smaller than the ones for one, two, four, or five. Three is really small. Three is a big denominator. So after, in Hardy Ramanuj, the big one is one, the next is minus one, and the next two are third and minus two. But here, these are 10 to the 3 as opposed to 10 to the 32. And there seems to be no reason. It's just when you add up certain dialog rooms, you happen to get a, a complex number whose real number is, is positive but very small. And there doesn't seem to be any way to predict that. But I can do what you said. If, I, if C is big enough, then I can show eventually none of the terms can beat any of these. And that's what I roughly did to say it won't help. And if I keep going here, I, I listed the next five, but they're much smaller. They won't help. But then these secondary terms, also then ship in. But then I did the tertiary. In my program, if I didn't make mistakes, for all C up to quite a big point, I had all of the contributions. I mean, this entire horrible sum, it's a real mess. And eventually, it looked like I I'd included all terms that would contribute, and that everything else would be less than 10 to the 11. I was left with this approximately 10 to the 11 I couldn't get rid of. As I said, I don't know. But my object wasn't to give very rigorous proofs because anyway, the method is a little non-rigorous because I haven't given the estimate even near a single point kappa. Nor do I, so I don't know exactly to what extent. Well, in principle, I do. The, the leading term is a pure exponential. Remember, the actual formula for eta, like the one I showed, eta of minus eta 2 of minus 1 over tau, is a product of two etas. It was always a pure, or for every s, I showed that eta s of gamma tau was equal or from or kappa plus a constant over t to the s. Uh, this was always up to some power of t of sum. So if you put some power of t, I don't remember, t to the minus s, it was a sum of pure exponential. So as a function of t, it was a, a, a convergent sum. That was the main theorem. And only finally many of those have a positive exponent. And the others, I think, will contribute nothing, but at least something very small. So in principle, you know, it, it is a rigorous method, but for each individual contribution, well, what I haven't done at all is look at the overlap of various intervals, if there's anything like small arcs and big arcs. And it, it's not a piece of analysis, it's a piece of number theory. I'm trying to find out what the contributions are and how they depend on the numerics of C and N, and what N looks like modulo C and so on. And I did not try to prove anything rigorously. My guess is be a lot of work. Like if one is a, a, a good student, it would be maybe a full PhD thesis, like three years of work. It's not something even a really good analyst could sit down and do in, in an afternoon or probably even in a, in a week. I think it's, it would be really, and it's probably very interesting to do, but it's, it's definitely a non-trivial problem to actually do this rigorously. And that wasn't my object. Um, there are so many places where I was throwing away things. I did worry about that one particularly. Or anyone in outer space have a question? Otherwise, we can go home five minutes early, have a drink. So I see you all again, I hope, at least most of you, on Wednesday at 2, and then that's the last time. <laughs>